Hello and welcome to today's Silver Spring Networks webinar, The Future of Revenue Protection at Utilities. Uh, today's webcast is going to explore one of the many use cases of our SilverLink sensor network platform, revenue protection. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over the screen in front of you. You'll notice there's a menu bar along the bottom with several windows. Some features that might be of interest include the Resources window, which has links to more information about SilverLink in the App Catalog, including applications from a partner detectant, who you'll be hearing from today. There's also an icon at the bottom that allows you to share this webinar through social media outlets. And please note that you're able to enter questions at any point throughout the presentation through the Q&A box. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for a Q&A segment at the end of the presentation today, um, during which we'll try to address all of your questions. Finally, to enlarge the slide area, just click on the box in the top right corner of the presentation window. I'm Emma Rich, a Product Marketing Manager for Silver Spring Networks, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I focus on our AMI and SilverLink businesses, including strategy, go-to-market, and product launches. I joined Silver Spring earlier this year after seven years as a consultant, analyst, and reporter in the smart grid and clean tech industries, most recently as Senior Smart Grid Analyst at Green Tech Media. I'm joined today by Mimi Zhang, Product Manager for SilverLink, who joined Silver Spring earlier this year as well. Previously, she was a consultant focused on quantitative technology and regulatory analysis in the smart grid, energy storage, and renewable space. Thanks for joining us, Mimi. Thanks, Emma. Happy to be here. We also have Wayne Willis, the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Detectant. He's been with Detectant since its inception in 2004. He has more than 20 years of experience in the utility industry, developing and supplying systems in areas such as meter data analytics, asset management, and customer care. Wayne, can you get us started by telling us what you hope the audience will get out of our conversation today? Sure. Thank you, Emma. Detectant is proud to be part of the SilverLink network. I think the most important message of the day is about what you're building with SilverLink. The network will enable utilities to gain significant benefits from the SSN system without the heavy burden of IT infrastructure costs. In this hour, we'll talk to a couple of specific examples where the Detectant SilverLink integration adds unique and innovative value to the utility. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Um, so, so as Wayne just referenced, today's webinar is going to explore the topic of revenue protection, why it's important to utilities, typical methods of theft detection, um, new capabilities that are being enabled by smart meters, and new sources of data that are only available through the SilverLink sensor network. Mimi and Wayne will share some case studies, some specifics on what types of data is being used to minimize the loss of electricity uh, through both technical and non-technical losses. First, here's some background on Silver Spring. We've connected more than 19 million homes and businesses to our multi-application networks, supporting applications in the energy, water, and smart city markets. We have more than 100 partners, some of which you'll be hearing about today, and numerous patents for our technology. The Silver Spring solution we're discussing today is, as I mentioned, the SilverLink sensor network which incorporates data from any utility network, system, or external source to make it easy for applications to integrate, operate, and produce insights. In short, SilverLink turns smart grid big data into business value. SilverLink is scalable, secure, and an open big data platform that doesn't force utilities to replace legacy data sources and applications. Using an API, it provides access to real-time data delivered in a consistent format and without the need for individual integration efforts by utility IT departments. The result is better data delivered in real time, producing better, faster results for the utility. This isn't an application that just sits on top of your MDMS, your OMS, your CIS, and gets batch data to process. We improve the speed of analytics and enable insights in real time. We push intelligence to the edge of the grid for distributed processing, which is reduced, it reduces the strain on networks while still allowing utilities to leverage all the new pieces of data available through smart meters and through other intelligent devices. Now, one other important thing to note is that the platform provides an open development architecture that allows you to build custom analytics or add solutions from Silver Spring and our partners. Now, I'll go over some of the types of analytics that utilities can leverage through SilverLink. So today's webinar is focused on revenue protection, but 
as I mentioned, there are many use cases for the Silverlink sensor network. Utilities can integrate apps from different vendors or, or use the API to make their own. Our open ecosystem results in a lower cost to create and test and a faster time to deploy. But on the screen here, you can see a sampling of some of the applications that Silverlink currently supports. This includes apps and customer engagement, which lets utilities present near real-time usage and itemized bills to customers uh, down to the appliance level with personalized, targeted, and accurate tips and budgeting tools. This really moves beyond today's printed reports and basic web portals um, to revolutionize the utility customer relationship. We also have demand-side management. Um, these applications provide customers with better ways to manage energy use and in help utilities increase participation in efficiency and demand response programs. Our customer care and outreach applications help increase the impact of utility programs while making the programs easier to manage. Solutions include customer segmentation and e &B tools. Today, we'll focus on the applications in network management and grid management. Um, which you can see over to the right. The, these applications help utilities improve the operation of grid network, uh, of the grid and of networks by pinpointing theft, voltage issues, equipment anomalies, and network issues that can lead to added costs, equipment damage, outages, or brownouts. What's key is that utilities can pick and choose the apps they need at their own pace and in a way that makes sense for their business, rather than forcing you into our model. So the adoption of analytics is driven by the potential to help utilities eliminate the manual workload-intensive systems that require interpretation by operators. That typically leads to unnecessary truck rolls and inefficient use of field resources. But most of the solutions you'll find in the market today really limit utilities' ability um, to a single vendor's capabilities. This results in vertical, siloed applications that require integration by IT departments. Adding a new data stream to an existing solution requires yet another integration effort. Many of these solutions limit customization in order to keep their costs down, but this also limits the utility's choice and requires them to pay for solutions they don't need. Proprietary platforms also don't let you choose from the best-in-class solutions from multiple vendors. Silverlink is especially powerful when you consider the limitations of these existing solutions. Are solutions more scalable, more open to innovation? Um, and more user-friendly than vertically-oriented applications approaches. Our componentized app model lets you pay as you go, buying only what you need and growing your analytics capabilities over time. All of the applications benefit from Silverlink's data platform. Integration only happens once, which reduces costs and, and speeds the return on investment, even when you're adding new data streams in the future. As I mentioned, our open ecosystem allows you to pick and choose functionality from a variety of app makers to create your own unique solution. And finally, we're the only platform um, vendor that can use real-time data. So these differentiators are especially important as we discuss revenue protection today. All the new data available through smart meters, as well as advances in networking and data analytics, they're enabling revenue protection to be more accurate, faster, and efficient than ever before. However, very few solutions can capture the granularity of data necessary in real time to enable the next generation of revenue protection which is what makes the Silverlink detectant solution so powerful. A key part of how we support utilities in revenue protection is an application from our partner, Detectant. I'd like to turn things over to Wayne for a minute to tell us more about Detectant and give us some perspective about the field of revenue protection and where it is today. Thanks again, Emma. Detectant has been providing meter data analytics solutions to utilities since 2004. A lot of the focus historically has been on revenue protection and continues to be on revenue protection, but we do offer other forms of analytics. Today we have more than 35 million meters in our systems. Our product, Customer IP, is an enterprise-wide utility analytics platform. Certainly the key areas of interest for many utilities uh, when you talk about rep meter data analytics is revenue protection, AMI deployment and operations, customer engagement and support, demand-side management programs and the, and the analytics to support those, and grid asset loading and visualization. Customer IP is a scalable analytics solution that offers value to any size electric and water utility as well as gas utilities. The pre-built Silverlink integration, a natural progression for us as we've been working with so many Silver Spring Network customers, 
offers significant advantages to Silver Spring Network customers, including speed to benefit, lowest cost of ownership, and the ability to quickly access valuable data. The profile of revenue protection, uh, for those of us who have been in the business for, for the, over the past decade, has changed dramatically. Revenue project, protection is now viewed as a key component of smart grid related analytics, both in North America and around the world. The figure on the right speaks to the investment utilities are making in the smart grid, both in North America and worldwide. The invis investment has risen from $0.5 billion in 2012 to $1.5 billion in 2014, a threefold increase and it's expected to reach close to $4 billion, an eight-fold increase by 2020. I'll, I'll pass back Thanks, to Emma. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Minimizing electricity losses is a significant challenge for utilities, but it also presents a massive opportunity for savings. Um, the causes of lost electricity can include technical problems, such as equipment failures or inefficiencies, <laughs> and non-technical losses due to billing errors, malfunctioning meters, and theft. So unless they're able to identify and correct these types of issues, these losses impact utility revenue, and all of the customers pay the price for electricity theft in the form of higher rates. Now, I'd like to introduce Mimi to add some perspective about how lost revenue impacts utilities. Great, thanks, Emma. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the meter to cash process. So for any type of business, um, you basically have to sell stuff and get money for it. So for the utility business, you really do this through the meter to cash process, and it's absolutely critical. Um, like with the telecom industry, utilities have to accurately measure customer usage in order to bill accordingly. So these meters with which you can measure usage, um, a lot of them are traditional analog meters. They're read by a person who drives around and physically looks at them on every home, usually monthly. But a lot of utilities have now moved over to smart meters that are read over the air, and these are typically read multiple times a day. Now, customers are then billed on their metered usage, usually around every month, and uh, billing is still largely paper, but a lot of utilities offer electronic billing, and that's really taking off and becoming more and more popular. And these bills, both paper and electronic, now often include some more tidbits of info, as well, usually including things like how your current bill compares with your usage over the last few months. Now, while most people do pay their utility bills on time, some fall behind, and collecting on debt is a very difficult process, especially for utilities. In many places, delinquent accounts cannot just be shut down because there are safety reasons. So there can be little incentive to pay up if you know that your account will not be shut down, your service is gonna continue. Um, and then adding to that, there are also a lot of issues with billing errors because a lot of people move around and switch service types and things like that. So it is actually very hard to keep track of that. Um, and these can result in some significant revenue losses. So, you know, let's talk a little bit more about just losses in general. We use that term a lot, but what does it really mean? So in the U.S., around 8% of electricity consumption is lost in a couple different ways. One is just technical, maybe you know about 6% or so, and these are just largely transmission distribution losses. They're due to the laws of physics. We generate a lot of electricity far away from where it's consumed, so you just lose a good amount um, during that process of moving it to load. There can also be some technical losses uh, more on the distribution grid that may be avoidable if you have the right data and methods to deal with it. And then there are non-technical losses, which are estimated to be about 2% or so in the U.S., and these come from, you know, billing errors, metering issues, and theft. So I just want to note here these numbers are for the U.S., which has really low non-technical losses. Um, it's going to be a lot higher in the developing world. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, but in general, non-technical losses are addressable, so utilities are leaving a good amount of money on the table if you're looking at about 2% of electricity consumption. So how can revenue protection help? I think every utility has some kind of revenue protection initiative. It can just be a person sitting there doing spreadsheet analysis on account data and usage. Um, but what's really important is to keep moving forward and figure out ways to capture that 2% and then get paid for it. And so what you do is you, know, you, you really look for leakage points 
you then revenue protection can help you provide the analysis and data to plug those leakage points. And you're going to hear more about this from detectants. So in the U.S., the cost of avoidable losses, you know, we estimate to be up to 3%, which is huge, and that includes the 2% from non-technical losses and up to 1% that you can get just from, you know, operating your distribution grid more effectively. So at the end of it, though, revenue protection is a really important part of the AMI business case as well. We talked about meter readers going once a month to look at analog meters, but if you have advanced metering infrastructure, you can be getting data from your meters multiple times a day. And while there isn't a person looking at your meter monthly, you can get a lot more value and a lot more accuracy on what's going on at that meter throughout the entire month. So I'm going to turn it back to Emma now. Thanks, Mimi. So utilities accept a certain amount of electricity loss as a part of doing business. However, there are ways to leverage smart meter data to minimize and eliminate at least some of the losses at most utilities today. In order to combat losses, you have to look at the different ways loss occurs. This allows you to uncover the patterns and data that, data that can be used to identify the various causes and to support programs that let utilities identify and isolate these causes faster and more accurately. As Mimi referenced, there are two main types of losses, technical and non-technical. Technical losses occur in the transmission and distribution system. The T&D losses, you know, are between 6 and 8 percent are considered normal. Um, and this is typically due to some of the energy supplied by the generator being lost due to resistance of wires and equipment that electricity passes through, as, as well as loss to heat. So beyond this, additional electricity can be lost due to equipment failures, non-optimized transformer loads, and non-optimized voltage. Although we won't be diving into these use cases today, Silverlink's portfolio of applications includes solutions to help address and minimize technical losses. For example, voltage management, support for you know, CVR, conservation voltage re reduction programs, and asset management. The second category is non-technical losses, and there's great variation across the globe. While it could be 1 or 2 percent in a typical kind of U.S. utility, uh, the World Bank has documented cases as high as 50 percent in India and over 30 percent in El Salvador, for example. No matter what, there's significant value in every market to reducing these losses. And this is an area in which smart meter data is crucial in helping utilities reduce electricity that's being generated but not paid for. Whether it's due to you know, in unintentional billing errors or theft or metering errors or actually intentional non-billing by a utility employee, the benefits of reducing NTL are twofold. It's the increase in energy sales and the decrease in losses. With increased sales, you know, some of this NTL will convert to paying customer usage. And there's the potential for prosecuted customers being billed for prior stolen power. In terms of a decrease in uh, non-technical losses, you know, any integrated utility would be supplying less unpaid power and reduce the overall operating costs. Silverlink has several applications that can address the various causes of NTL, um, including you know, theft detection, revenue protection, as we'll discuss today, um, but also metering operations and budgeting tools, such as prepay, that can also help eliminate these cases of lost electricity. Now, Mimi will go into more detail um, about some of these non-technical loss examples and the types of data that can be used to identify theft. Great. Thanks, Emma. Um, so let's start by talking about billing and collections um, as a source of revenue leakage. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, this can be a good amount, estimated at up to 1% of U.S. electricity usage. And um, you can detect, you know, if you have issues with billing through just frequent analysis of billing records and usage. And some examples of when you have inaccurate billing or record keeping, um, it often happens when just new customers open a new account and uh, one or the other account never gets billed. You may have mismatched meter program where, say, a commercial customer ends up on a residential meter program. They don't get billed for their demand charges. And what's also very common is when a customer moves away, closes their account, so there's an inactive account, they're not getting billed, um, and new occupants move in and start using that service without opening a new account. And this can be addressed by, you know, looking at the data and just doing a straightforward remote disconnect if you have smart meters. So billing errors can definitely be detected and avoided. Um, 
uncollected debt, as we discussed earlier, is a much harder one. And I would say the best way to deal with this is to catch it early and immediately start working with a customer if they're unable to pay their bill. Because once you get a year, two years worth of accrued debt, it's going to be a lot harder to collect on that. Now, another source of revenue leakage is just from metering errors. And these may not always be the result of tamper or theft. It, it can be, but sometimes, you know, meters themselves may be incorrectly programmed. They may malfunction. Um, they may just not be measuring usage properly. They could be damaged just from weather or um, other things, and they may just have the wrong meter program on them. So one uh, also um, big example of metering errors is when you just have unmetered usage. And this can often happen at construction sites or just at new buildings where somebody requests new service because they're putting in a new building and the service gets turned on, but uh, the installation of the meter gets missed. So they're just getting service without having to pay for it. This can also happen during a large equipment replacement where some homes just get missed or if somebody gets a service revision. And you can detect metering errors, again, just like with billing, through frequent analysis of account records, looking at expected usage, and then comparing with actual usage. So now we'll talk about theft, um, which varies widely across the world different countries of the world, and it can cost utilities a lot. Even in the U.S., where we have pretty low theft, as we mentioned earlier, um, we're looking at about 1%. Those are the estimates um, that you see from analysts here. And that can be worth about $6 billion per year, which is a, a good chunk of change. Um, if you look at this averaged across ratepayers in the U.S., that comes out to about $40 per customer per year, and that's money that all of us are paying extra on our rates to account for others stealing. Um, this can also lead to equipment damage um, because if somebody is stealing, it can often you know, cause voltage fluctuations, which can damage neighbor equipment, like neighbor's pool pumps, other things, as well as um, infrastructure, utility infrastructure on the distribution grid. And so that equipment cost isn't even factored into this six billion. Now in the developing world, a lot of places see much higher percentages of theft, especially in low-income neighborhoods. Um, this is also common in countries where there may be political unrest, where the utilities may socialize, privatize, go back and forth. Um, a lot of times, utility workers may get laid off when things like that happen, so they make money by offering tamper services um, to those who can't afford or don't want to pay for their, their electricity. So this pie chart on the right, you'll see, just kind of gives an estimate of, you know, the cost of theft in different countries. This is annual in U.S. dollars. So India's got a huge chunk right there. Um, the U.S. is pretty big, even though the percentage is low. We use a lot of electricity in the U.S. And then, um, you know, theft, there are lots of different types of theft. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's a little bit more difficult to detect, especially with accuracy, than just billing errors. Um, you're going to want a lot more different types of data for that, which um, we will cover in a little bit. So I wanted to give a little bit more detail on the impact of theft in a couple of specific locations, just to put it more in perspective. So you know, Austin Energy estimated about 1%, so 9 million or so, as their cost of theft in 2008, and then BC Hydro, a couple of data points that have been in the news. Um, they looked, they did a revenue protection initiative, uncovered 1,500 diversions, which yielded $5 million. So if you're curious, that comes out to about $3,000 per diversion. And then they estimated that the cost of theft on their territory is about $100 million a year. So that comes out to about $50 per rate payer per year. So that's every person paying about $50 more a year on their bill just to cover theft for the utility. Now in Brazil, higher. So Light estimates that they probably get losses that are over 600 million US dollars a year through theft and fraud. That comes out to over $150 a year. Now compared to Austin's figure, that's about $20 a year. So you can see there's a huge difference per rate payer just among, you know, developed versus um, more developing world or places where you have higher theft and crime. So 
Um, we'll talk a little bit now about the different types of theft. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways to categorize theft, um, but here's, you know, here's one way to look at it. So we look at tamper, bypass, swap, inversion, and then for smart meters, reprogramming is also a, uh, something to be concerned about. Tamper can be done, you know, most of these can be done on either analog or smart meters. So for tamper, you just, you may put a magnet on an analog meter. Uh, if you have a smart meter, you might try to block the signal, and uh, smart meters will send back a tamper event flag if something like that happens immediately. Um, meter bypass is when you just route power around the meter so that your usage is just not even being metered at all. Um, swap often happens if you have areas with a lot of abandoned homes where somebody may take a meter off an abandoned home and just switch it with their own so that they're not getting billed for anything and the usage is being billed to the abandoned account. Then um, you have inversion, where somebody may reverse the energy flow. You can turn the meter upside down and switch the wires, so they're actually, their usage is coming across as positive um, energy sent to the grid. And then, as I mentioned, reprogram, this is, is pretty difficult to detect. Um, I think later on we're going to talk about the different types of data that you need to be able to accurately identify these different types of theft. First, I'll turn it back to Emma. Thanks, me. So, you know, as we've referenced, detecting electricity theft has been traditionally addressed by you know, physical checks of, of tamper evidence seals by field personnel and by using balance meters, both techniques that can reduce unmeasured and unbuilt consumption of electricity, but both are, are really insufficient to identify the advanced cases of theft that we've been talking about. You know, tamper seals can be tricked, and, and balance meters don't always precisely identify um, the, the case of theft. So the adoption of smart meters has vastly improved utilities' capabilities in minimizing losses. Smart meters are enabling utilities to improve the speed and comprehensiveness and efficiency, as well as the accuracy of theft detection. But many challenges still remain, and not all the solutions are capable of leveraging new data streams and real-time information. Now, decreasing NTL or theft is directly increasing revenue and preventing unnecessary costs to ratepayers. But if it's so advantageous, why aren't more utilities doing it? You know, why is theft so hard for utilities to detect? First, theft detection is a challenging process. Um, you know, I think that's something that is very important to establish. Although smart meters have made it easier to remotely identify theft, it's a huge endeavor to internally perform a thorough analysis of account and meter data. And managing volumes of real-time and historic data is, is also a challenge for utilities. Therefore, correctly identifying theft uh, can be slow and time-consuming. Following leads requires truck rolls, and the operations group is, is often overburdened with follow-ups. You know, this, this means that there's value in more accurate theft detection and reducing false positives. Integration of data and vendors is, is also a time-consuming and costly process. This limits the ability to test new solutions or add new data streams as they become available. As anyone knows who's worked with data coming from various systems and devices, all from different vendors, the data generated by end devices requires cleaning. Files are out of order, exports look different, there are different naming conventions, gaps in reads. Um, that makes it hard for analytics applications or departments inside a utility to use data because someone has to spend time and money cleaning these data streams for different end purposes. Um, if a vendor that has been integrated wants access to another data stream, it takes a long time to go through the information request process again, and that requires heavy lifting by IT. And because theft detection involves a big data ask of the utility, many vendors end up getting something old, incomplete, or a smaller amount of data than they'd like otherwise. Certain types of theft is harder to detect without certain data. So by limiting data streams because of the high cost, um, this can limit the effectiveness of your NTL uh, initiatives. Finally, you know, many theft detection solutions today are not very timely. Um, most NTL solutions, whether a purpose-built solution um, by a vendor or something developed internally at a utility with their own algorithms to pinpoint diversions, they use data after the MDMS processes it. That's at least 24 or 48 hours old, sometimes you know, 30 days, and it's been filtered. As a result, real-time theft detection isn't possible through these methods. And in many cases, a, a month could go by before a particular case of theft is identified and validated. Now, the revenue protection environment today is much different with smart meters than with electro, 
the electromechanical meters alone. Uh, Wayne, can you give us some context on some of the new capabilities enabled by AMI? Sure, thanks, Emma. So if you look to the left, the, um, when you did not have AMI, we had AMR, we had uh, manual meter reads. The data sets we were limited to and the tools available to the utility is relatively small. We're getting a monthly read with, with manual reads. We have people in the field that are seen and present, and that's a positive. We have meter readers that visually see our equipment. Uh, but there's a limited amount of data in the back office for us to perform analytics on. With AMR, we, lost, we continued to lose our eyes on the equipment and, and no longer had visibility of personnel. We did get tamper flags, but then you had to be able to correlate those tamper flags to something that occurred in a, in a monthly bucket without being able to directly associate it with a specific event or point in time. AMI gives us a number of new, um, new, new data sources and new tools to use. Most importantly, we can take that hourly and sub-hourly data and we can correlate events to the actual time that they occurred so that we can see whether it was a legitimate event or uh, something that shouldn't have happened. And we also have the uh, broader spectrum of data that we can bring in to give us further analysis like voltage, like temperature, and, and help correlate what was happening to the meter at the time that we think something, something nefarious or otherwise happened. So I'll move, ba move back to, um, to Emma for one more slide here. Great, thanks, Wayne. So one example of how smart meters and AMI improve revenue protection is by pinpointing the different types of theft that Mimi told us about earlier. Detecting different types of theft requires different types of data. Now, for the reasons we just reviewed, uh, many vendors have only a portion of the data they need to detect advanced theft, and it's challenging or impossible for them to access new data as it becomes available due to the high cost of integration. Here's how Silverlink helps. Silverlink makes data available in a consistent fashion for multiple end purposes. A utility's internal team can get streams of data without having to gather it from different databases. Um, this also works for any of the applications that we enable, like Detectum. Um, it's already packaged for you, and it's in one consistent naming convention. Silverlink also makes the process of future integration efforts easier and faster. Therefore, when you or existing vendor applications, when they need data from the CIS that's newly available, they can access that data via the Silverlink platform instead of needing a new integration by IT, which would you know, otherwise cost time and money. Um, with the combined Silverlink detectant solution, utilities get a powerful, um, a powerful solution that collects more data types and correlates them to find patterns and makes theft detection more accurate, um, reducing false positives, reducing the workload on your operators, and enabling better use of field resources. Now, Wayne, could you give us some examples of other new capabilities in revenue protection? Sure, Emma. Um, so smart meter data analytics truly is the game changer, game changer for revenue protection. The example shown on the right is of a residential premise, and if you look to the bottom, it's a consistent shape of consumption that, on the monthly view, looks to be an efficient user of energy. They are, they're consistently paying their bill. Their monthly consumption moves up with, up with the heating seasons, down with the cooling, with cooling and all of that. Everything looks normal. But when we do a, a deep dive with interval data, um, even at the hourly level, the data can reveal that this customer is consistent, but their customer is consistent at pulling the meter from the socket and therefore maintaining a consistent shape of energy at a monthly level. Without a drill down into interval data, this would not be detectable in this customer. Another example where interval data helps is it allows the utility to use analytics to determine if a customer's monthly bill will change within a few days of installing a new meter. This helps the utility uh, ensure that a customer with a previously under-registering meter will not get a bill that they perceive to be high because the now functioning meter, fun now uh, new meter is functioning correctly. It, this also allows the, um, as, as some, some folks believe, that the um, best time to tamper with a meter is directly after it's been set. This, allow, this approach to monitoring what the bill was and what the bill should be with the new meter allows the utility to monitor for immediate tampering on meter sets, uh, knowing that you might get some um, events that indicate the meter was being worked on at that time, but will also draw out the fact that the customer's bill is going to change. So that's some significant value out of the data there. We'll talk a little bit um, at this point, just a few minutes on on, on the key elements of a revenue protection program. And as um, Mimi and Emma already mentioned, every utility has a revenue protection department or a revenue protection function within, the, within their utility. And most likely all of the elements that, that we're about to talk about exist within, within those programs. 
these are just some of the approaches that uh, some of the main areas that we think are make sense to talk about and the ones we talk about to our customers. So the key elements really of revenue protection program include determinants of where to start, what's, the, what's most important to the utility, meaning that is it a revenue focus, is it a safety focus, is it, is it um, a, a, a cleanup of a specific area? And then what to examine, once I understand what my objectives are, how should, I, how should I best go about looking at accounts that best meet my objectives? And then how to be efficient. If I'm going to um, attack this problem of lost revenue, for instance, or safety issues, what's the most cost-effective way to do that? And then how do I measure the success of my program so that I can, I can look at what I need to do in subsequent budget, budget cycles? Technically, um, or typically, utilities have more revenue protection work that they can do, and being proactive with analytics only exasperates the problem. One approach to determining where to start is to perform a point-in-time energy balancing across the network at the feeder level. The feeders with higher than average total losses might be the best place to start. The graphic to the right shows a map view of a neighborhood with possible revenue protection issues highlighted in red and amber. A, a way to focus my efforts might be to focus on a red dot which says most likely to be a problem and then grab other other potential issues in the neighborhood and take take care of them all in one in one um, truck sweep and although we're talking about revenue protection the utility's first priority is always safety i've heard it said many times that an avoided hazard is worth a hundred times the value of a theft case the Detect and Silverlink integration pulls all of the data together that helps you identify unsafe conditions, including loading, temperature, and power data on the meter. When we talk about how to be efficient, the um, one method is to group investigations geographically. You might, for example, group one or more high-priority cases with other low-priority cases, maximizing the value of field services, time and, time and cost and effort. The figure to the right shows an example of overlaying high-priority cases with low-priority cases on a map view for geographical grouping and assignment. Another approach is to look at the resources that are required, such as the type of meter you're going to, going to be working on, and group based on type of meter and geographic, geographic area. Other tools that ensure efficiency are field tools designed specifically for revenue protection. Customer IP includes a set of investigation tools designed to ensure that field investigations are performed consistently across the utility. These include interactive tools to measure the expected load on the meter at the time of the investigation, as well as tools to capture exactly what was found and observed during, during a field investigation. Lastly, we talk, we talk a lot with our customers about how best to measure, measure the success of a program. Historically, one of the most common methods was, was to measure what you were able to backbill your customers. And this was a very prominent, in the, certainly in the last 10 years, this seemed to have been a prominent uh, indicator of a revenue protection program. However, as we, as we move more into the proactive area and we're working with more frequent, uh, frequent high-frequency data, um, we get better insight into our meters and our customers. It's probably not the best indicator of success. Avoided future loss, meaning once we have corrected a situation, what delta revenue does the utility receive is probably a better key indicator than what we can backbill our customer. And it's probably more in line with the utility's overall goals. Break to fix time is another. How long has the situation existed before we detected and corrected it? Finally, customer satisfaction. If we're able to reduce our break-to-fix break time, we're able to minimize our back bill as a result, revenue protection now has a direct effect on customer satisfaction. And Emma, I'll pass back to you. Thanks, Wayne. So we like to call what we're discussing today the next generation of revenue protection. Uh, staff detection is evolving to a model that's more precise, more real-time, and more accurate. Silverlink and Detectant enable this by providing better data. Um, first, utilities can quickly implement staff detection solutions using our platform approach, um, whether it's a third-party application like Detectant or one homegrown at the utility. One of the things that's especially unique about Silverlink is the capability to integrate certain networks. This gives us access to the real-time data and also enables two-way communication and distributed intelligence and processing. Um, Real-time analytics are important because they empower utility programs to have the maximum impact. The more recent the data, the more actionable it is, whether that information is facing your grid operators or your customers. 
I also mentioned uh, distributed intelligence. Um, you know, our Silver Spring network, network customers have the unique capability of distributed intelligence and processing to help you gain more intelligence without moving and crunching as much data, which reduces the strain on networks, reduces processing time, and enables you to do more and gather more information without driving up network costs. Um, you know, second, Silverlink makes data available in a consistent fashion. Um, a utility's internal team can get the streams of data without getting it from different databases. It's packaged for you and uh, consistent naming convention. Um, finally, Silverlink makes the process of future integration efforts easier and faster. So as I mentioned, when new and uh, or existing vendor and applications need data from a system like CIS, they can access this data through the Silverlink platform instead of needing a new integration effort. Now, Mimi is going to talk more specifically about the joint uh, Silverlink detectant solution and how it works in the utility environment. Great. Thank you, Emma. So if you look at this slide, you'll see some graphics um, showing the, you know, the data value chain. That's how we like to think about this process. So on the left side in blue, you'll see this is what Silverlink covers. Um, and what we do is we deal with all the data gathering, the cleaning, uh, do some hypothesis testing to figure out what, what is relevant data, what does a revenue protection app really need to support it and to do comprehensive and accurate analysis. And then we make that data available via standard API. We pre-integrate with partners before we go to the utility customers. And we are gathering new types of data over time. This includes high-frequency data, more channels that are currently not available through meter programs. Um, and by high frequency in real time, we mean really high frequency, like sub-minute, you know, every couple seconds, real time as in available almost immediately after the, the timestamp. And then on the detectant side, they do a lot of really important stuff, as you can see. They take that data, do all the analytics, provide the insights. They integrate with the utilities workflow system so that it's pretty seamless. Um, and then they also take action and feedback from results in the field to continually improve their algorithms. So now we'll turn it over to Wayne to talk about a couple new capabilities that we're, we're looking at. Thanks, Mimi. One of the big challenges for utilities is the existence of indoor marijuana grow operations. At least wait, they're a challenge until they all become legalized. So they create a significant safety hazard to both the public and the utility workforce, as well as a source of lost revenue to the utility. Features enabled by the Detectant Silverleak integration provide the tools necessary to identify the existence of a bypass for a grow, grow operation. A combination of meter voltage data and meter temperature data combined with the ability to perform energy balancing to a transformer allow the utility to identify these conditions without putting their employees at risk. The Detect and Silver and Silverlink integration also enables unique methods to identify potential stolen meters by providing information on neighboring meters. When a meter communicates through the Silver Springs network, it, all, it can also identify its neighboring meters. A meter that suddenly begins to report a set of new neighbor meters may be a stolen meter that has been relocated by, by, by the person that, take, that took the meter. The information from the new set of meters can be used then to isolate the location of the stolen meter. The Detect and Silverlink integration offers a number of tactical advantages to the utility. It also offers a number of economical and strategic benefits. These include lowest cost of ownership, speed to benefit, and a one-stop turnkey product support. The Detectant Silverlink integration also allows the utility to selectively and strategically take advantage of higher frequency data, producing better and faster results. We now will let Emma talk, talk about other solutions that can lever these same, same advantages through the Silverlink sensor network. Thanks, Wayne. So Detectant is one of the key partners in the Silverlink app catalog. Um, we actually received a question through the Q&A about, you know, real-time data and, and how it can be made available for other purposes. Um, and, and this actually speaks to this point. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the other use cases is, you know, this same real-time information can be used in customer portals. It can be used in, in other um, analytics applications. So here you can see uh, just a selection of a few Silverlink partners. 
Um, our partner solutions all have this, this turnkey, turnkey integration that I talked about, allowing utilities to add analytics applications while minimizing impact on the IT department. Um, you can add analytics over time as they're needed, not being forced into one particular vendor's solutions offering. Um, this app catalog and our open seek ecosystem for, for smart grid apps does just that, resulting in the widest selection of apps from multiple vendors. Now, Silverlink allows utilities to incrementally add applications, such as theft detection or voltage monitoring, as their budgets allow. Applications can be added faster and at a much lower cost and risk to the utility, all the while setting a foundation for future applications. There are no stranded assets, and analytics investments are future-proofed. The addition of new analytics solution provides more value, but there's no reason that utilities should have to do it all at once and pay for a, you know, a large platform up front. Today, we've discussed a few of the use cases for Silverlink, such as theft detection or improved billing, um, just talked about you know, customer portals and customer budgeting tools, voltage management, and CVR. Each one of these adds to the overall value of the AMI deployment. At this point, I'd like to wrap up the presentation and get started with our Q&A. Just a reminder about the resources available to you. On the left hand of your screen, there's a link to our brand new ebook on six of the many use cases for Silverlink. There's also a video, a demo, and a link to more information about Detectant and their customer IP solution. You still have an opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A window. Um, we have a number that have come in through the webinar, so if you aren't able to get your questions uh, addressed today during this webcast, we can follow up with you individually. So I will start um, with a question about the, um, let's see, the tampering mechanism in smart meters, um, whether that varies according to smart meter protocols or whether it's specific to hardware. Um, Mimi, would you like to address that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give this a shot. So in smart meters, you know, every smart meter is a little bit different in terms of what the capabilities are, but there are some protocols and standards. There's the C1219 standard that helps um, any of us figure out, you know, where the data is, what it's called, what types of data tables are available within certain meters. And at Silver Spring, what we do is, um, you know, we actually put a network interface card in in every smart meter that we network, and that card has a lot of um, computing power. So every time, you know, when a utility implements AMI, what they usually do is they'll go in and say, okay, we want, you know, hourly interval reads of usage and voltage and then event flags. Um, but what Silverlink is now doing is using the computing power on our network interface card to actually um, be able to go in and, you know, in additional and parallel to that meter program, we can go and read anything on that C1219 table and bring it back with more, you know, higher frequency at higher rates um, than the existing meter program. So we can do that without needing a new truck roll. Um, but there, yes, there are definitely protocols and standards around um, how you might get tamper results. And that is in a really riveting document if you want to read the C1219 standard. Thanks, Mimi. Um, we have a question about uh, real-time data. Uh, maybe, Wayne, you can address this one. Um, can Detectant run their analytics on Silverlink's real-time data? Sure, thanks. I can take that. So, and it actually ties to a second question I saw a little further down, which was if I'm, if I'm an existing Detectant customer and I'm an existing Silver, uh, so Silver Spring Network customer, can I still take advantage of Silverlink? And I think the answer to both is yes. And I think it's probably near real-time data. Data would come through Silverlink. You'd have to crunch the analytics, but you might choose to do more time-sensitive analytics, something on temperature, something on voltage, in um, through the Silverlink integration. And then some of the more more um, onerous back-office analytics might be done in a in a in a, in a slightly more time-delayed mode. But yes, absolutely. Thanks, Wayne. Um, we had a, a housekeeping question um, about um, the presentation being available. So everyone will receive a link to the recorded presentation um, that you'll be able to, to replay. Um, we have a question here about um, you know, whether there are actual users that can 
back up some of the revenue loss and, and retrieval, retrieval uh, through the use of AMI and Detectance tool. I can, I can take that. Do you have that. any thoughts on that one? Thank you. Yeah, I can take, I can take that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in the small networked world of, of, um, of utilities, uh, almost everything, especially revenue protection, is something that's very measurable, very talked about, very much out, out in front. And thankfully, utilities are not um, typically in competition with each other, especially electric utilities and for the most part in the United States. So um, there's a lot of data out there uh, from utilities one-on-one -on -one to each other exchanging about the, the benefit of the two solutions together. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Um, our next question is about revenue protection um, in different parts of the world. Um, how does a revenue protection initiative differ in a developing country versus the U.S., and what about places with political unrest or, or high crime? Do you want me to take that one again? Yeah, that would be great. Sure, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so, the, so the interesting thing, if you go to somewhere where you used the example, I think, of India earlier on your thing, where, where losses are, are dramatically higher than they were elsewhere. So in some cases, you might look at it as saying, there are things I could do, I could do tomorrow by, with visual inspection. There's also things I can do with analytics. So you might consider it as almost as a, a peeling of an onion. In the United States, we have to peel the onion because we have um, a, anything that's obvious will be taken care of, and now we're down to the more complex, a, complex um, cases of revenue loss that we need analytics for. That, that need is everywhere worldwide, but it's a matter of balancing it with what else can I do with, field, with visual inspection as well. Great. Hey, thanks, Dwayne. Um, we have a question about uh, how the higher frequency of data collection from smart meters, um, how that affects the Silver Spring network, and does it affect the network bandwidth? So this is Mimi. I can take a, take a stab at that one. So obviously high frequency data, especially coming back more often, um, is going to have more of a burden on the network. What we do is um, if it's higher frequency and coming back more often, we just schedule it so that it does not interfere with our billing reads whatsoever. Those happen every four hours. So there's actually a lot of time between those four hours to bring back other data from the meters. Um, as we're looking at you know, more granular data, obviously there's going to be more of that. Um, we encourage our customers to be selective about what channels they actually want. And we also roll this out in stages. And for certain places, like say, you know, if your utility you're concerned, you want to do a really deep dive into uh, revenue protection, and you want to be grabbing, you know, much more granular data for a couple of different data channels. You may want to start with just your high risk regions first, and kind of then move on. Um, you know, switch those meters back to uh, or stop the high frequency read, move on to another new territory to really focus on so that you're not reading you know, high frequency data from the entire network um, all the time, because yes, that is a lot of data. Um, but we do a lot of you know, studies on bandwidth, and we, try to, we really try to work with our customers so that they don't need to add any type of infrastructure to be able to at least start getting what they want and see the value in it. Great, thanks Mimi. Um, we had a question about um, you know, kind of the existing market. There are already a lot of data storage solutions for utilities. Um, you know, is, is it really that hard for revenue protection apps like Detectant to get the data that they need? Would you like, would you like me to take that one? Sure. Yeah, well, um, maybe you can speak to this. So what Silverlink does, uh, so, so yeah, so we have, Detectant has a number of different flavors of our integration to a, lot, a number of different systems. We certainly um, talk about being system agnostic on, in, in all cases. However, what Silverlink gives us is it gives us from, uh, from a point of view of Silver Springs Network is the ability to um, take all that data from what, primarily from one source in a pre-built fashion that we can move from utility to utility. But it also adds in, let's take a look at that example of the neighboring utility. So stolen meters and the meters rep, um, telling us what the neighbors are and what the neighbors are after it's moved. That data typically would never come into a, um, a utility system. So the Silver, Silverlink solution can, can automate something like that, very specific, that then can be replicated from utility to utility. 
So yes, absolutely, there's lots of different systems and we integrate to them. The Silverlink network, uh, the Silverlink integration just gives us an added advantage of being able to create a repeatable product that, that the utility can say, I want these analytics even though I have no source for this data or nowhere to store this data. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Wayne. Um, we have just a, a couple minutes left, so we'll, we'll try to get through some of the remaining questions here, but um, please feel free to, to, to continue to submit questions. As I mentioned, uh, we can follow up individually. Um, so we have a question about how the uh, decentralized computing and intelligence on a NIC uh, through the Silverlink sensor works. Mimi, can you address that? Yeah, sure. So. Um so basically the NIC, which is the network interface card, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's got a pretty decent computer on it, especially some of our later generations of NICs. And so that can do more than just read data off of the meter and send it back through the Silver, Silver Spring network. But what it can also do is um, it can actually do some simple calculations on there so that instead of sending back, you know, multiple different data channels, you may program the NIC to actually look for just anomalies. So you might be able to go in and say, you know, for meter temperature, um, measure the temperature every five minutes, every five seconds, whatever the meter hardware is actually capable of, that's your limit there. Um, so if it's every five seconds, you can look at the temperature every five seconds and just send back, um, you know, an alert through this through the network if the temperature is beyond above or below some kind of threshold that you set for it. So instead of bringing back meter data, um, sorry, temperature data every five seconds, which would, you know, cause potential overload on the system, if you're doing that a lot, um, you're only bringing back the anomaly. And so you're reducing the traffic over the network and you're able to do the exact same analysis that you want to, but it's really, you know, at the edge of the grid on the meter instead of in a central location. And there's also less delay in that because the meter itself is only looking at, you know, its own data. So you don't have to bring the data back and run it through some app or algorithm that has to crunch, you know, data from every single meter on the network. You're only getting back the alerts that you want. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Mimi. Um, we have a question about um, whether a solution like this that we've discussed today, um, you know, for revenue protection, for theft uh, detection, would need two smart meters, or whether that's capable with with kind of what utilities have deployed currently. Sure, I can talk to that. Uh, certainly, the analytics are designed to work off of what the utility has deployed. Um, in all cases, where we can take advantage of other sensors on the grid, we we, we want to do that. But that's typically this what you have deployed today, uh, not adding physical hardware. Great. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, so we have a question about theft and, and the different types of theft. Uh, what is the, the most common type of theft to, de, um, to detect in your experience? Wayne, can you take that one? Sure. So uh, certainly prior to, um, prior to AMI, just customers pulling meters in and out of the socket was a, was a big issue. Uh, the, the, in, in the AMI world, um, on the residential side, you can pull a meter once, you can install something behind the meter, you can install something around the meter. So that concept of bypassing, and it doesn't have to be a bypass that's 10 feet from the meter, a bypass within the meter socket. We're going to see potentially one or two events where the meter is in and out of the socket, and then nothing else. So that's going to be a com that is going to re remain a common way of stealing. Um, programming we haven't seen a lot of yet, but it's certainly something to be safeguarding against. And we do a lot of consumption patterning to look for situations like that. Certainly, an incorrectly programmed meter, but not one that's been interfered with by a customer yet. Um, on the commercial side, there's still the, the more the significant bypass is still an ongoing issue in the, um, in the in the commercial side, and that doesn't change with AMI. It's still you still have to have ways to detect that. Great, thanks, Wayne. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar, and, and thank you for all the great questions. In the meantime, please reach out if uh, you have any other questions. Um, thank you, and uh, goodbye.